businesses in the tourism industry that Order about Senator Brown. any plan. It being 2 p.m., we'll go to questions no without notice. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I seek leave to make a statement regarding a ministerial absence. Leave is granted. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I advise the Senate that Senator Payne will be absent from question time today, Wednesday, 3 February 2021, due to ministerial business. In Senator Payne's absence, I will represent the Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, and the Minister assisting the Minister for Trade and Investment. Senator Rustin will, invest, will represent the Minister for Women. Senator Cash will represent the Attorney General and the Minister for Industrial Relations. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Yesterday in question time, the Minister said, and I quote, the confidence that Australians have in the vaccines that we have available is going to be absolutely crucial to the take-up of vaccines across the country and to the protection of Australians, particularly those who are most vulnerable. Are the comments from Mr Craig Kelly assisting or hindering confidence in the vaccines? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank the Senator for the question. And I would, at the outset, confirm the statement that I made yesterday. I stand by that wholeheartedly. Uh, it's, it is an extremely important thing, Mr President, that Australians have confidence in our national vaccine strategy, Mr President. Uh, I, I, I repeat and reaffirm those statements, and Mr. President, and the and and the the medical and the health advice that we have received from those that are guiding our response to COVID-19 is extremely important, Mr. President. And I can confirm to the chamber, Mr. President, that the Prime Minister has today met with Mr. Kelly. Uh, and Mr Kelly has, in a statement, confirmed that meeting that he met with the Prime Minister this morning. And uh, the Prime Minister has reinforced to Mr Kelly uh, the importance of enduring public confidence in the government's vaccine strategy, confirming my statement of yes, mis yesterday, Mr President. Well, Mr President, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's reasonable that the Prime Minister has conversations with his colleagues in this place. And, uh, and reinforces the Prime Minister's Order. point of view, Mr President. And as a part of that process, Mr President, in his statement today, Mr, Mr. Kelly has said, I agreed to support the government's vaccine rollout, which has in, been endorsed by medical experts. And Mr Kelly has also said, Order. I have also always sought to support the, su Order. the success Senator of our national public health response during the pandemic. And he believes that the spreading of misinformation can damage the success of our public health response during the pandemic. So, Mr. President, I, re I, I reinforce, Mr. President, the statement that I made yesterday, particularly in the context of the vaccine rollout for senior Australians, Order. who Senator we Colbeck, all understand time for the are the most has expired. Senator, what supplementary question? Thank you, Mr. President. Yesterday, the minister said he was disappointed in, and I quote completely reckless commentary with respect to the vaccine. Does the minister agree that Craig Kelly continually undermining public confidence in Australia's medical experts and the COVID-19 vaccine is, and I quote, completely reckless commentary? Before I call Senator Colbeck, I, don't, I just uh, remind, urge members to um, also use formal titles. I thought I might have misheard that, if I have my apologies, uh, but please use Formal titles of members of the other place. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And yesterday I did condemn the Labor Party's reckless strategy of undermining our order. vaccine Senator, rollout. Senator, Senator, Senator Watt. Um, order. Senator, Senator Watt. He, he's been speaking for six seconds, but I'll allow you to raise the point. It was order. long enough to know on relevance. The question was clearly about Mr. Kelly's comments, not about the Labor Party's comments, and. The minister should stick to Mr Kelly's comments. Um, on the point of order, Senator Colbeck. Uh, order, Mr. Senator President, Colbeck on the point of order. Mr President, uh, Senator Watt order. was clearly misquoting what I said yesterday. Uh, clearly misquoting what I said yesterday, order. partially hey. quoting my statements. So, sorry, so Senator, 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 Colbeck, fully... Senator Colbeck. Uh, well, Senator Wong, with respect, um, I, I, I do grant people some latitude to introduce their point of order before I call them. 
if the, I, I, was, I was going to ask the minister to come to a point of order, the minute you started saying it was a selective quote, minister, that is, that is not a point of order. Um, but if you wish to raise a point of order on direct relevance, I'm happy to hear it. Or there's a time to debate or answer the question. On the point of order, Senator Watt, I'm not going to rule halfway through the first sentence um, a minister being not directly relevant to an answer. The question did contain an extensive quote from the minister. He is allowed to put that quote in context and address the substance of that quotation as well. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, and I again repeat that yesterday I condemned the Labor Party's reckless approach to undermining our vaccine strategy. Their commentary is not useful, Mr. President. And I repeat Order. the statement that, that uh, Senator White has also made Order. repeated today that the, that the strength of our vaccine strategy and the public confidence in our vaccine strategy is absolutely vital to the take up of vaccine in this country, Mr. President. And that's why the Prime Minister has called Mr. Kelly in this morning to have the conversation that he has. And I think that's appropriate. I think that's appropriate. Uh, I don't support anybody who's providing information that undermines the national vaccine strategy we have, Mr. Have, Mr. President. And I have to say, Mr. Kelly is getting more airtime by the publicity given to him by the Labor Party than he is by his own means, Mr. President. It's the Labor Party who's elevating this issue beyond order, where I Senator believe it Colbert. should be. Senator, order. Senator Watt is on his feet. Order, order. Senator Watt is on his feet for a final supplementary question. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr Kelly has been spreading reckless and dangerous misinformation for months. Why has it taken so long for the Morrison government to tell him to stop? Is keeping Mr Kelly happy more important than the health and safety of Australians? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. The most important thing from this government's perspective the most important thing from this government's perspective is the health and safety of Australians and the confidence that Australians have in the vaccine rollout that we will commence very soon, Mr President. That is the most important thing to this government. That's the most important thing. And so we will continue Order. to do, on the, on the advice of the medical experts, everything that we possibly can uh, to ensure that there is a strong level of pu public confidence in the vaccination program that we are about to roll out and that Australians can, with confidence, take up the vaccine that's going to be provided as a part of that rollout process, Mr President. That is the most important thing to this government uh, and to me, Mr Order. President, in my ministerial Senator duties. Watt. And that's what we will continue to reinforce, that we have Order a strong, health-based uh, supported by expert evidence and the great work of our world-class TGA advice to have confidence Order, in the Senator vaccination Colbeck. rollout. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister update the Senate on the devastating situation occurring in Perth right now with the Warraloo bushfire that's burning out of control in Perth's eastern suburbs? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator O'Sullivan for the question. A bushfire is burning at the emergency warning level in the shires of Mundaring, Chittering, Northam and the city of Swan, 27 kilometres northeast of Perth, an area I know well and love, as I know all Western Australian senators do. The bushfire remains uncontained and out of control. The West Australian Department of Fire and Emergency Services has confirmed that 71 properties at least have been destroyed and the bushfire has so far burned over 9,000 hectares. I'm advised that no lives have been lost and no one is yet unaccounted for. However, there remains the potential for wind changes, maintaining very unfavourable conditions. We urge everyone to stay aware of their surroundings and follow the advice from local emergency management authorities. While weather conditions have been hampering firefighting efforts, our emergency services personnel are, once again, showing their professionalism and their dedication and their heroism in the face of these extreme conditions. On behalf of Minister Littleproud, on behalf of the federal government, and I know all senators in this place, I thank everyone who is contributing and working so hard in the firefighting effort to protect these communities and to ensure that there is no loss of life. Our thoughts and our prayers are with the people of Western Australia and with all of our emergency services 
and, most importantly and most sincerely, with all of those impacted by these horrific fires. Senator O'Sullivan. Mr President, I thank the minister. Can the minister outline what federal support, including ADF assistance, has been made available to support WA authorities with this threat? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you again, Mr President and Senator O'Sullivan. The Australian government has acted swiftly in support of the Western Australian government's response. The Australian government disaster response plan has been activated by Minister Littleproud. He is also activating Australian government disaster payments for those most affected in the Mundaring and Swan gov local government areas. Today, Defence is supporting water bombing operations from RAF Base Pierce, which yesterday same, was in uh, extreme danger. And they're assisting firefighters to move to the fire front. Defence will also fly additional fire retardant from Rach Rich RAF Richmond to Western Australia. Last year, Defence completed a strategic review of Operation Bushfire Assist to ensure that our support to natural disaster was optimised. Consequential changes are now making it easier for defence to assist states and territories, and I thank all senators who Order. supported Senator that. Senator Reynolds, a final supplementary question. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on defence's assistance to WA authorities and their COVID-19 response as well? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you again, Mr President and Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, as we are all aware, the West Australian government is fighting not only a COVID-19 outbreak in Western Australia, but also these fires. Yesterday, Defence accepted a request for additional assistance to WA government's COVID-19 response. This support is in addition to the 1,500 ADF personnel still deployed across the country supporting COVID-19 uh, in, in actions in all states and territories. And this includes 150 currently working in Western Australia. So, with this uh, addition, 50 staff, 50 additional staff, will be based in Perth, supporting the West Australian Police conduct vehicle checkpoints in Perth, Peel, and the Southwest region. Vehicle checkpoints are police-led, with ADF providing marshalling and initial assessment of vehicles. And this takes the total of 200 ADF members on task in Western Australia to 200. This includes 93 personnel who are still supporting quarantine compliance measures Order. in Senator seven Reynolds. hotels. Senator Lyons. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I would seek leave to associate myself and indeed all of my Labor colleagues, and particularly my West Australian Labor colleagues, with the comments that were just made by the minister. And I would like to seek leave to make a short statement. Leave granted. Leave is granted for a minute, Senator Lyons. Thank you. And obviously, we concur with the thanks to the emergency service workers. Um, like Senator Reynolds, I have many friends who live in the area, and it's an area of Perth where you have acreage that meets outer suburban areas. Uh, in fact, a former staff member of mine, Reese, was evacuated um, two nights ago at 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, I also uh, want to acknowledge the uh, huge kindness and generosity of the Perth community. There's all sorts of offers of help, as you can imagine. Um, being a, an area of acreage, there's prize horses and other livestock, which um, people all over the metro area are offering to adjust. There's free meals being delivered. And once again, as we saw the Sikh community uh, in the eastern states respond to the fire community, the Sikh community in Bennett Hills, is, uh, who's a suburb that's likely to be threatened, uh, are also out there working. So that uh, generosity, I'm sure, makes all of us as West Australians very proud. And, um, I thank the, the minister for the response that uh, the federal government has given. Thank you. Senator Seward. Thank you. Um, I seek leave to uh, associate uh, the Greens with the minister's comments and to make very short comments as well. Leave is granted. Um, Senator I, I thank the minister and the government for the response. I think every West Australian member in that other place and uh, senators has friends and family that live in the Hills area and live in that area. I certainly do myself. Um, so the Greens are very thankful for the response uh, from the federal government, and we wish well to every single emergency personnel 
uh, uh, and people that are currently fighting the fire and defending people's uh, homes and lives, and also our hearts go out to everyone that is affected uh, by this current disaster, given the particular circumstances that Western Australia is facing and the Perth metropolitan area is facing at the moment with the double impact of the COVID lockdown. Um, it is a very stressful time at home in Western Australia, and I thank the government for the response that they are making. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister confirm the Prime Minister has now met face to face with Mr. Kelly? Did the meeting occur today? What did Mr. Morrison say to Mr. Kelly? And what commitments did the Prime Minister get from Mr. Kelly? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, we'll Obviously, uh, obviously, the Prime Minister meets with and speaks with uh, his colleagues uh, on a frequent basis. But I can confirm that he met, as indeed Senator Colbeck has already told the Chamber, uh, that he met uh, with Mr Kelly, the member for Hughes, uh, this morning. Uh, the Prime Minister made clear uh, that the Prime Minister and the government uh, do not support any views that undermine the vaccine strategy, whether made by Mr Kelly or anyone else. Mr President, Mr Kelly has subsequently issued a statement referred to by Senator Colbeck, uh, in which Mr Kelly has made clear uh, that uh, he had a meeting with the Prime Minister, that the Prime Minister reinforced the importance of ensuring public confidence in the government's vaccine strategy. Uh, Mr Kelly has stated uh, that he has agreed to support the government's vaccine rollout, as endorsed by medical experts. And indeed, is the government's expectation, uh, and we will continue uh, to advocate strongly for the vaccination rollout uh, to be supported, backed across the Australian community, and for Australians uh, to be encouraged uh, to embrace it and to receive those vaccines as and when they are made available according to the targeted strategy that we have developed alongside experts. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question? Thank you, Mr. President. This morning, when asked by Ms. Plibersek whether Mr. Morrison agrees with his views, Mr. Kelly said, and I quote, you have to ask the Prime Minister, I don't know. What did the Prime Minister say to Mr. Kelly that he's unwilling to say publicly? Senator Birmingham. No. Mr. Mr. President, I've just, I've just outlined what the Prime Minister said to Mr. Kelly and what Mr. Kelly has put on the public record subsequent to his meeting with the Prime Minister. Now, I have no doubt that, as the Prime Minister has done time and time again, uh, he would reinforce in the other place, in any meeting, the importance of the vaccination strategy and, indeed, the evidence upon which our vaccination strategy Order. is built. It's a $6.2 billion Order. vaccination strategy, Order on Mr. My right President. And left. A $6.2 billion vaccination strategy that entails four separate purchasing arrangements Order. for 140 Senators million Rennick doses, and Wong. 140 Senator million doses and Wong. of vaccine to be made available to Order. the Australian Senator people. Senator Birmingham, Senator Wong on a point of order. I repeat, I'll give Senator Rennick Senator leave Wong, to make statements if he wants Senator to have Wong, them. Please resume Tell us your what you seat. think. Senator Wong, please resume your seat. I was calling both of you to order. Interjections are disorderly, as is responding to them across the table and the chamber. Order. Senator Rennick, that's not helpful as I'm calling Senator Wong to order. Senator White, you've been particularly voluble in the first 20 minutes. I'm going to ask you to take a breath for a while. Senator Birmingham, please continue. Thanks, Mr. President. So the government's position is crystal clear. We have worked alongside our health experts, as we have at every stage of the pandemic, order. in terms of the procurement strategy, the distribution strategy, and our focus. With Senator absolute focus and resolve order. is on Senator seeing Birmingham. that strategy implemented. I'm having trouble hearing Senator Birmingham. Um, not usually a problem Senator Birmingham has. It means there's way too much noise coming from the chamber. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Does Mr Kelly's public statement acknowledging the damage of disinformation extend to Mr Kelly removing all content peddling disinformation from his Facebook, Parler, Telegram or any other social media accounts? Has Mr Morrison asked Mr Kelly to post his statement on his social media to warn his followers of the damage of disinformation? Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. Uh, Mr. Kelly's statement, uh, as I've referenced, is publicly available. It's publicly available on social media platforms as well, and we expect that Mr. Kelly uh, will uh, will work uh, within the terms and content of that statement. Order, Senator. Senator Keneally, on a point of order. I did directly ask if Mr Kelly would remove the content he's already posted. The minister's that answer provided an answer that he would, in future, not post any se news. Se se I asked the minister if he can ask, answer that question. That was the conclusion of your question. Um, if I had a better chance of hearing, if I had a better chance of hearing Senator Birmingham, I'd be in a better chance to rule on points of order. So, on both sides of the chamber, I asked people to not interject and to not take the bait and respond to interjections. Senator Birmingham. Oh, that was Senator Birmingham was concluded. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small. Order, order, Senator Hughes, please stop. Order. Can people at least pretend and 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 you know hold their breath for ten seconds after I call people to order? I mean, there wasn't even there was not even three words out of Senator Hughes' mouth there before the interjection started. It's going to be a long year if that's the case. Senator Hughes, start again, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Clock. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is continuing to build a stronger Australia by supporting Australians to undertake an apprenticeship and developing Australia's skilled workforce through its $74 billion jobmaker plan? Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Hughes for her question. Uh, Mr President, as we know, the Morrison government is investing in ensuring that Australia has the skilled workforce that Australia needs. Uh, without a doubt, looking at the Morrison government's investments, we have made skills development at the absolute heart of our economic recovery from COVID-19. And In fact, as we now emerge in 2021 from the impacts of COVID-19, we will continue to build on our record of skills reform uh, to support, in particular, new apprentices into training. Two of the signature policies of the coalition governments are the job trainer policy signed with all states and territories, uh, a joint commitment releasing almost 320,000 new low-cost or free training places. The key is in areas of labour market demand into the training space, but also the boosting apprenticeships commencements. Um, it's been a tough year for employers, and the boosting apprenticeships commencements wage subsidy is all about assisting employers to bring a new apprentice or trainee into their workplace. The boosting apprenticeship commencement subsidy it supports employers of any size in any geographic location, in any industry, to sign up a new apprentice with a 50 per cent wage subsidy up to $7,000 a quarter, running through until 30 September 2021. Mr President, there's still nine months of the program to run. And what we've seen to date is over 29,000 employers, and I'm very pleased to say this includes 21,000 small businesses register over 73,760 new trainees or apprentices for the program. This includes bricklayers, 5,600 carpenters and joiners, 4,700 electricians, 4,600 sales assistants, 4,000 automotive electricians, and over 3,800 hospitality workers. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the government's early action through the Supporting Apprentices and Trainees wage subsidy supported small businesses to keep apprentices on the tools and supported small businesses with their cash flow through the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, as I've just said, we put in place the Boosting Apprentices and Trainees wage subsidy. That is to bring into the system 100,000 new apprentices and trainees. But of course, when COVID-19 hit, we understood as a government uh, we needed to provide critical support, in particular to small businesses, to keep the apprentices or trainees they already had in training on the job. That was one of the first economic responses that the Morrison government put in place in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Supporting Apprentices and Trainees Wage Subsidy it has now supported more than 58,500 small and medium businesses to keep 117,000 apprentices and trainees in work today, because that's where we need them 
on the job. Over 17,000 electricians, 22,000 carpenters, joiners and bricklayers, 5,500 hairdressers. They have all been kept on the job because of the policy that the coalition government, the Morrison government, put in place. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister Cash, how will the government's record skills investments support labour market recovery and help Australians find secure work as we emerge from COVID-19? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the skills investment that the Morrison government uh, is putting in place, this is all about generational change, and it will support Australians to get the qualifications and skills they need, importantly, to secure jobs after the pandemic. We want them to train up in areas where we know there is labour market demand. This is, of course, crucial, uh, in particular to supporting job security, economic productivity and quality of life for all Australians. Uh, in relation to the labour market, over the last seven months, we have now seen, or Australians have now seen, 784,500 jobs return to the economy as COVID-19 restrictions have eased. Hours of work have now increased 165 point million, and full-time employment was the majority of employment uh, in terms of jobs growth in both November and December of last year. We know there is a long way to go, but the policies that the Morrison government is putting in place is seeing jobs return Order. to the economy. Senator Cash. Senator Griff. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Birmingham, representing the Treasurer and Assistant Treasurer. Minister, as you be aware, there are now over 56,000 registered charities collecting well over $10 billion in donations. However, the secrecy provisions of the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission Act mean that if someone has a complaint against a charity, the complainant isn't permitted to know the outcome. And if the charity is subsequently deregistered, the public has no way of finding out why it was deregistered. Minister, can you advise whether the secrecy restrictions will be lifted in the legislation government is drafting in response to the 2018 legislative review and when you will introduce this legislation? Minister representing the Treasurer and Assistant Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Well, thank you. Um, uh, thanks, Mr. Uh, thanks, Mr President. And I thank Senator Griff for his question. Uh, and indeed, I do understand that the, uh, the review of the ACNC legislation concluded that the secrecy provisions of the Act are overly restrictive and should be amended to allow the Commissioner to disclose information in a wider range of circumstances, including to protect public trust and confidence in the sector. Uh, the review went on to state that uh, the ACNC's inability to make any comment in respect of whether it is or is not undertaking an investigation in respect of a complaint against a registered entity uh, is harmful to the perception of the ACNC as an effective regulator. Uh, the government uh, released its response to the ACNC legislation review on 6 March 2020, I understand, uh, and has agreed uh, to recommendation 17 of the review, which will provide the commissioner with the discretion to disclose information about regulatory activities, including investigations, when it is necessary to protect public trust and confidence in the sector. Uh, the Treasury is currently engaging with the ACNC uh, and will prepare advice for the minister on how to progress the necessary legislative changes to give effect uh, to that uh, government agreement to the recommendation. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, Minister, uh, there's a difference between giving someone discretion and actually publishing um, um, issues of, uh, for complainants, and I think it's very important that there isn't discretion and it's actually made mandatory. Now, the 2018 review also flagged raising the revenue threshold for a small charity from $250,000 to $1 million which will give thousands of charities much lower reporting requirements. Do you consider it is appropriate that a charity that receives a million dollars in funding should not be required to provide an annual financial report? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. In relation to, uh, to the first part of, uh, of Senator Griff's supplementary uh, question there, uh, obviously discretion, uh, particularly in relation to public um, information about investigations that are underway, um, is I think an important factor to strike uh, an appropriate uh, balance to be exercised by the ACNC uh, between maintaining public confidence through the release of information, but also through not eroding public confidence uh, through potentially the release of information prior to investigations reaching a certain point uh, of findings or, uh, or transparency that, uh, that would be helpful to the maintenance of, uh, of public trust. Uh, as I indicated, the government uh, uh, has agreed to 
uh, the recommendations. I, sorry. I indicated the government's agreed to recommendation 17 of the ACNC review. In relation to, uh, to threshold limits, uh, look, I, uh, I will have to double check uh, the response that has been provided uh, by the government Senator in that regard. Time uh, Senator Griff, and come back expired. to you. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, just back on discretion. Uh, should there be discretion um, for, a, uh, uh, for a member of the public not to find out why a um, a charity has been uh, deregistered. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thank, thanks Mr. President. Look, uh, in the main, um, I would anticipate uh, that where a charity has been deregistered uh, under the reforms that are being proposed, uh, that should be made public. Uh, there may be elements of, uh, of such grounds that, uh, that uh, discretion may be applicable for. Uh, but uh, I'm certain the government would be happy to consult uh, as we are drafting the necessary legislative changes with you, Senator Griff, and, uh, and happy to reach out and work in that regard with you. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister update the Senate on the Morrisons government's comprehensive plan to roll out the COVID-19 vaccine to all Australians? Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, can I thank Senator Brockman for his question and on indulgence, Mr. President? Can I acknowledge the bushfire emergency in uh, Senator Brockman's home state of uh, Western Australia, in the Perth Hills, and advise the Senate that there are two aged care facilities in the area that have their emergency management plans activated and are on standby to activate uh, evacuate as a last resort should that need eventuate. And there's a couple of others that are preparing. And can I? Uh, acknowledge the staff who have been working around the clock to make sure that the residents of those facilities are kept safe and comfortable. Uh, Mr President, the vaccination of Australians against COVID-19 will commence later this month, and we are working to ensure a, an orderly rollout to priority groups which is safe, effective Mr. President, and well explained. Our rollout strategy will be one of the largest logistic exercises ever seen in Australia. Our government is investing $6.3 billion in what? with almost $1.9 billion for medical bodies, logistics companies and general practices and community pharmacies to roll out and administer the vaccine. We expect there will be thousands of sites that will support the rollout, ensuring Australians can access a vaccine regardless of where they live. Mr. President. Australia's world-class primary health workforce will be the cornerstone of the COVID-19 vaccine rollout across the nation. Mr President, the health workforce, including doctors, nurses, midwives, pharmacists and many other allied health professionals, have continually risen to the challenges of COVID-19 over the past year. Mr President, and they will play a pivotal role in supporting the rollout of vaccine to all Australians. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. Can the Minister outline to the Senate when aged care and disability care staff uh, and residents will be given priority access to the vaccine? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, Australia has developed a roadmap based on a phased approach. The purpose of phasing is to identify and make the vaccine available to high risk Australians. First, our priority, phase 1A, is being given to aged care and disability residents and frontline staff, healthcare workers and quarantine and border workers. Phase 1B, where up to 14.8 million doses will be made available, includes those aged over 70 years. Uh, phase 1B also includes Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over 55 younger adults with an underlying medical condition or disability, and critical and high-risk workers, including defence, police, fire and emergency services. Order. Phase 2A Mr. President, includes adults over, aged over 50, Order. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over 18, and other critical Order. and high-risk workers. Senator Colbeck. Um, Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Minister, can you further explain the phase rollout strategy as part of Australia's COVID-19 vaccine roadmap. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Brockman. Phase 2B covers the, the balance of Australia's adult population. 
and phase three, those aged under 16, if recommended. The Therapeutic Goods Administration has provisionally approved the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine for use in Australia. Rollout of the AstraZeneca international dose is being considered by the TGA today and on track for an early March rollout subject to TGA approval and final shipping confirmation, Mr President, and that's for the AstraZeneca vaccine. Our compre comprehensive public information campaign will keep Australians fully informed and up to date about the, early, uh, the safety and effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccines as they become available, including when and how and where to get vaccinated. Senator Hanson Young. Order. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Leader of the Government representing the Prime Minister. On October 30 last year, the government was handed the final report from Professor Samuel, Graham Samuel, which reviewed the adequacy of Australia's environment laws. It was a damning assessment. That was more than three months ago. When will your government respond and implement laws that actually protect our environment and implement an independent watchdog to hold those who trash our environment to account? Those who trash our environment and endanger our wildlife. When will your government act? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Hanson Young uh, for her question. Uh, indeed, uh, it was our government that commissioned Graham Samuel's review of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, uh, just indeed as it was a coalition government uh, that initially passed the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act back in the Howard government era. Uh, and so this side of politics has a strong track record in terms of uh, the, the passage of and delivery of uh, legislation that provides nation-leading protection in relation to nationally significant areas of environmental protection. Uh, we will respond in an appropriate way uh, to the review of Graham Samuel. Uh, we'll do so in a timely manner. As you know, it was late last year that that report was handed uh, to the government. Uh, we'll do so in a manner where we're conscious of uh, all of the recommendations and findings uh, of Graham Samuel in that review. Uh, those recommendations find areas for strengthening of, uh, of environmental standards in some areas. And they also find evidence uh, that uh, there is excessive uh, bureaucracy or delays that occur in some areas that can be alleviated as well. Uh, and so our government is determined to make sure uh, that in terms of the operation of our environmental laws in Australia, they should operate uh, for the protection of our environment, but they should not unnecessarily act as a handbrake in relation uh, to economic progress and development, and particularly at this time of economic recovery uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it is essential that, uh, that those laws, uh, where possible, also facilitate uh, growth uh, of job opportunities and employment opportunities uh, and avoid, wherever possible, duplication uh, between Commonwealth laws and state and territory laws or Commonwealth approvals processes and state and territory approvals processes. Uh, and so we will respond uh, to that report uh, and, as appropriate, bring different packages of legislation to the parliament. Order. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The independent reviewer Graham Samuel said in his report, the government should remove the exemption of regional forestry agreements from the EPBC Act and require logging in native forests to be assessed against national environmental standards. Does the government commit to doing this, and when will you do it? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. We will respond to, uh, to the report in a comprehensive way, as the government always does. Uh, Professor Samuel made many findings, made many findings in relation to his report, uh, including, uh, including findings in relation to, uh, to forestry. He also made findings uh, in relation uh, to the way in which the EPBC Act operates, as I said, for the environment, but also for business. Uh, we will work alongside stakeholders as we finalise our formal response uh, to the recommendations. Uh, and in fact, uh, I understand that Minister Lee uh, met last week uh, with the stakeholder group uh, to discuss the process uh, and the work around responding to those recommendations. Professor Samuel's uh, work was comprehensive. He engaged extensively across Australia, uh, and so we will make sure we apply a comprehensive approach to responding to that report too. 
Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Former Prime Minister Bob Hawke. Bob Hawke. Former Prime Minister Bob Hawke saved the Franklin from damming. Malcolm Fraser saved the whales from whaling. Is this Prime Minister Order. a leader that will save our native forests? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, uh, we will work hard indeed to, uh, to, um, uh, to ensure in responding to this report we do so in Order. ways that save native forests whilst also saving forestry Order. jobs. We will work hard in ways as well as our government is doing across the board in terms of other aspects of environmental leadership. Now, this is a government that has banned the export of plastic wastes from Australia. This is a government that is investing significantly in terms of the recycling and reuse capabilities of Australia, showing environmental leadership in terms of the reforms that are there and the actions being taken by Prime Minister Morrison in particular there uh, to provide for better management of plastics in Australia, environmental leadership in, uh, in that space, and we will continue to do so in that space and others around the protection uh, of Australia's unique, nationally significant environmental assets. And that's indeed what the EPBC Act, implemented by a coalition government, was designed to do. And we'll make sure Order. our re Senator response Birmingham. to this review Time delivers the upon that. Time has expired. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question uh, is for the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Um, the federal government promised to release the electric vehicle strategy in 2019. It didn't come. Neither did it come in 2020, and we're now, we now find ourselves in 2021 still waiting. The vacuum in federal leadership on electric vehicles is now being filled by state, territory and even local governments going ahead with their own disjointed plans. This is somewhat reminiscent of Australia's rail track fiasco, which resulted in the country having a mismatch of narrow, standard and broad, broad, gauge, ra broad, broad range, gauge rail scattered across the nation. Just how long will it take for the Morrison government to come up with a national strategy for electric vehicles? What is the delay to this important strategy? The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Cecilia. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Thank Senator Patrick uh, for the question. Um, the Morrison government is committed to enabling consumer choice uh, when it comes to new vehicle and fuel technologies. So this follows, of course, our technology, not taxes, approach to reducing emissions. So we are developing, in answer directly to answer your question, we are developing a future fuels strategy that considers all of these new technologies, not only EVs. Uh, this includes hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, hybrids, and biofuels. And we've been working to ensure that the strategy is well informed. So to ensure industry has been widely consulted, uh, we will release a discussion paper in the very near future that will help inform the strategy. Uh, but we've already put our money where our mouth is with our $74.5 million future fuels package as part of the budget. Now this backs funding already committed through ARENA and CEFC, including $21 million for two EV charging networks and $11.7 million uh, for focusing on smart charging and tools to make it easier for motorists and businesses to purchase new technology vehicles. Uh, this includes projects uh, like $838,000 for Origin Energy to install 150 smart chargers at homes and workplaces across the national electricity market. $3.5 million uh, for Jet Charge to develop smart charging technology that will help make charging more user-friendly and will better integrate EVs into electricity. I'm, I'm always amused when, when I get Seth Rogen over there interjecting, but I'll, I'll keep going. We are serious about accelerating the uptake of new technologies and ensuring consumers' choice is supported. <laughs> order. Um, order. It took me a while to pick that reference. Before I call you, Senator Patrick, I'm going to take the chance to welcome back to the chamber former President Parry. Welcome back to the Senate, Stephen Parry. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, th thank you, Mr. President. Of course, uh, the government should understand, in terms of uh, consumer choice, the, the, the uh, car companies have made the choice. They are going down this pathway. In the absence of a national strategy, 
Uh, that, that's paved the way for a suite of ill-considered and premature taxes which will work against EV uptake and limit uh, Australia's ability to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Given that the government is fond of technology, not taxes, in its approach, uh, what is its plan to bring vehicle technology to bring down uh, emissions? Senator Cecilia. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Patrick. Um, look, the, 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 the development of electric, hybrid, and Order. hydrogen fuel cell vehicles Order. is being driven by the world's large car manufacturers, and that is indeed the truth. Now, the number of consumers who choose to buy these new vehicles will rapidly increase as the new technologies reach parity with mature alternatives. Australians are already making the choice. It's about choice, uh, Senator Patrick, to switch to new technology. So hybrid car sales almost doubled in the last year, increasing from 31,191 vehicles in 2019 to 60,417 vehicles in 2020. Our Future Fuels Fund is designed to help develop these technologies and provide choice for consumers. Now, we are bringing down emissions, as you know, 17 per cent already, almost 17 per cent, well ahead Order. of our targets, well ahead of the OECD Senator average. Watt. We are more than doing our Senator bit, Watt. and EVs will be, of course, a part of that mix. Order. Senator Watt. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Mr President, electric vehicles that are advancing towards being more than just a means of transport, they will become an integral part of the energy grid, providing uh, drawing from it during low low periods and feeding energy back into the grid during peak uh, demand periods. What is the government doing to ensure electric vehicles are properly integrated into the energy distribution networks? Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So, uh, the future fuel strategy uh, will consider the integration of electric vehicle into the distribution network. And as I mentioned in my previous answer, uh, we are already investing uh, in projects through ARENA and the CEFC, which will help address the barriers to uptake. And for example, for example uh, here in the ACT, uh, ARENA is investing $2.4 million uh, in a world-leading trial aimed Order. at better understanding and minimising Order. the Senators impact Wong, of electric Keneally vehicle charging on the energy grid. Order. So we're doing it here in the ACT. We're doing I'm it in South Australia. To, uh, we've committed... Please resume your seat. I am struggling to hear him. Senator Watt, you've had a lot of latitude this question time. Um, I, would, um, I appreciate that you're being so loud you might have trouble hearing me call you to order. I'm going to ask you to demonstrate some restraint for the next 13 minutes. Senator Seselja to continue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And so in South Australia, we've committed $5 million in the budget for a grant uh, to the ACE EV to support domestic battery, electric vehicle manufacturing and a vehicle to grid trial. Now, this is about providing choice for Australian consumers without driving up the price of cars in Australia or creating supply issues in the electricity Order. grid. Senator Gallagher. <laughs> Sorry, I was just a bit taken back by listening to Senator Seselja's new fondness Order. of the electric vehicle. Come to your question, Thank Senator you. Gallagher. Thank you. Yeah, but your choices are better than Order. ours, are they? Uh, thank you. Mr President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. On 7 January, Mr Morrison promised the government would deliver 4 million vaccine doses by the end of March. Will the Morrison government deliver on this promise? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator, for the question. Mr President, one thing, the thing that we've always promised to the Australian people and indicated to the Australian people is that our vaccine rollout would be based on vaccine approval uh, and then the delivery processes that followed along behind that, Mr President. And, Mr President, the Prime Minister said um, earlier this week with respect to the vaccine rollout, and, uh, Mr President, this is uh, what the Prime Minister said at a press conference uh, just recently, uh, that the four million position will be something that's going to be achieved in early April as opposed to late March. Now, Mr President, that's what the Prime Minister said just recently at a press conference. Mr Order. President, acknowledging the fact, acknowledging the fact On my left. that with some of the conditions that are occurring in Europe uh, and the scaling up of manufacture of the vaccine here in Australia, that that was the process 
uh, and that was the expectation. So, Mr. President, they are the Prime Minister's words from a press conference Senator just Keneally. recently, Mr. President. And so, we continue to work uh, with the TGA on the approval process. Uh, we continue to work with the vaccine companies on supply to ensure that we have. Uh, an available supply to roll out effectively to Australians across the country, Mr. President. And the thing that we have the, the thing that we have the benefit of, the thing that we have the benefit of, is that we are providing to Australians fully approved vaccines. We don't have to have the circumstances many other countries have been forced to do, which is to have emergency approvals for their vaccines. Australians, Mr. President, will benefit from the fact that the data that comes from the application of vaccines in other countries becomes available to the vaccine companies and then to our TGA for the formal approval of the vaccines. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Department of Health has said that the Prime Minister's target of four million doses by the end of March, and I quote, didn't seem to be possible. When did the department first become aware it was not possible to deliver on the Prime Minister's promise made to the Australian people? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, I've actually just indicated exactly the Prime Minister's position uh, and, the, and the way that we are rolling out the vaccine, Mr. President. So it would have been useful, Senator Seselja, if the Senator had listened to the answer that I've just given, because we have always said to the Australian people that supply, supply of the vaccine and the rollout process will be dependent on approval. Order. Would be dependent on approval and supply issues from manufacturers, Mr. President. And we've been very frank with the Australian people. We've been very open with the Australian people. Uh, and as issues have, ar uh, have, ar have arisen, we have told the Australian people what is occurring, Mr. President. And I've just given you the quote from the Prime Minister Order, where he Senator said Gallagher. it was more likely to be early April than late March for the four million vaccines, Mr. President. Order. And, that, and, that, and that is a statement of the Prime Minister. Order. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. By what date will the Morrison government deliver on the Prime Minister's target of four million doses in April? And will Mr Morrison accept responsibility if he fails to deliver on this promise? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, it is, it is really disappointing that, that the Labor Party continue to not listen to the answers that are quite genuinely provided to them and, and continue their reckless campaign to undermine the rollout strategy that we are running, Mr President. The recklessness of the Labor Party in trying to undermine the confidence of Australians in our vaccine strategy really should be condemned, Mr President. We have said consistently that the rollout and availability of vaccine would be dependent on approval by the Therapeutic Goods Administration, and we now fortunately have the Pfizer vaccine approved. And, and once it was approved, it could then be shipped, it could be tested by the TGA to, to ensure that it would do what we, it said it would do and was safe to provide to Australians. And we're now going through the process of the approval of the Pfizer of the AstraZeneca vaccine, Mr. President, uh, and we will continue to work with the companies Order, and the TGI the on a safe rollout of expired. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Can the minister please update the Senate on the Morrison McCormack government's plan for a gas-fired recovery, including the recent heads of agreement reached with the East Coast LNG exporters. The Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator McMahon for her question uh, and her deep interest in all things resources, particularly in your home territory of the Northern Territory. Well, I think everybody understands uh, that cheaper and more reliable energy is going to be absolutely fundamental to the economic recovery of Australia as we uh, recover from the COVID pandemic. And it's particularly going to be very much important uh, for our job maker plan as we get Australians back into work and, uh, and back, uh, back fueling our economy. So our gas-fired recovery is, is absolutely essential 
uh, and will be supported by the reset of the East Coast gas market. And we'll do this by unblocking gas supply, delivering efficient transportation and empowering customers to make sure that we are providing the best possible energy source for Australia. Um, last month, the coalition announced a new heads of agreement with the three East Coast LNG exporters oper operating out of Gladstone. And this means all uncontracted gas uh, produced by LNG projects will now be offered to the domestic market uh, at internationally competitive prices before it is offered into the international market. And, and this agreement, alongside the Australian Domestic Gas Supply Security Mechanism, will continue to put downward pressure on the prices of gas to ensure more gas is offered in the domestic market at a more affordable and competitive rate. Simply put, what we've done will push down the prices and increase as a result of increasing supply. And that means Australian businesses, Australian families will have the affordable and reliable gas uh, that they need. And it's about making sure that Australian gas works for Australians, uh, whilst supporting economic growth and backing the very, very important regional jobs that are on the back of this very important sector. More supply has brought more competition and lower prices and it will support our manufacturing sector, while at the same time we will support Australia's pursuit of reducing emissions. Gas is absolutely critical for manufacture. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister please outline how our government is ensuring sufficient gas supply for Australia? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, the Morrison McCormack government is delivering five strategic, uh, strategic basin plans to unlock new gas potential across Australia. We're starting with the Beetaloo Basin, which is in your home territory of the Northern Territory, as well as the Northern Bowen and Galilee basins in Queensland. The government uh, has announced a commitment to provide up to $50 million for the exploration of the Beetaloo Basin, plus $173 million to upgrade the roads to make sure that access is essential. Uh, so the Breedaloo Basin will bring jobs, Senator McMahon. I know that's something that's very, very important in your home territory, uh, as well as much-needed investment to, to northern Australia, but most importantly, affordable gas prices. Um, affordable gas is absolutely essential. No one could question the prosperity and the economic prosperity of this country and our manufacturing strategies will be enhanced by affordable and, uh, and accessible gas supply. The government is absolutely committed to give companies confidence to make sure that we can build on our economic Order. recovery. Senator Ruskin. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise why it is so important to ensure affordable and reliable gas supplies? And any risk to affordability and reliability for Australian industry and consumers? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, the government's position is absolutely clear in this regard. Unlocking gas reserves is the key to Australia's economic prosperity and our continued recovery from COVID. And part of that is making sure that we provide certainty, that provides the confidence to make sure that we have the essential investment in these critical resource projects to uh, about open up our economy. You know, Labor's Environmental Action Network, championed by some senators in this place, would seek to stop new gas projects and would actively be behave Order. to ban gas. Mark, I mean, basically, this network is Mark. responding to inner-city inner city, um, greenies at the expense of everyday Australians and the regional economies that so many on this side believe are so important for our Australian economy. I mean, the member, of Hunter, the member for Hunter has labelled them fundamentalists who have no idea about supporting real workers and real jobs. And it's pretty hard to disagree with the member for Hunter when he makes those sorts of comments. We will support regional Australia and we will support a gas-led recovery. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Last night, the member for Dawson took to Facebook in defence of the member for Hughes, accusing others and the, and I quote, fake news media, end quote, of trying to censor Mr Kelly. Does the Prime Minister agree? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, I haven't seen Mr. Christensen's remarks, uh, but uh, Mr. President, I'd make uh, I'd make a couple of observations. Uh, firstly, Mr. President, I would observe that uh, that this is often the case when these sorts of highly charged political debates occur. Uh, there are some who take an approach that seem to suggest that everything that's ever been uttered. Uh, needs to be retracted or withdrawn, and so let's be very clear Order. that uh, that you know, that our government 
stands firmly by our vaccine strategy. Our government wants to make sure that that is the number one focus of government policy delivery and of public dialogue in relation to building confidence around the vaccine strategy. As I have already told the chamber and as Senator Colbeck has told the chamber, the Prime Minister met with Mr Kelly this morning. The Prime Minister made clear that neither he nor the government support any views that undermine the vaccine strategy, whether made by Mr Kelly or by anyone else in that regard. We want to make sure the overwhelming focus is on building public confidence to receive the vaccines that we are investing in and that we have secured for the Australian people. And this strategy is crucial and a crucial part of the nation's health and economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Australia is incredibly well prepared because of the good work done last year to make sure we have a successful order. delivery Senator, of vaccines Senator across Wong the country. On a point of order. Point of order direct relevance, and I have been mindful of your previous rulings about glancing references, but we're at 23 seconds to go and nobody has addressed, nobody who's answering questions has addressed the question, which is whether or not the Prime Minister agrees with Mr Christensen saying that Mr Kelly is being censored. I'm listening carefully to the Minister's answer. I think he is directly addressing the subject matter. I can't instruct him how to answer a question, but as long as, he, as, long as he's addressing the matter of information with respect to this vaccine. I think that's directly relevant to the question. Um, Senator Birmingham, to continue. Thanks, thanks, Mr. President. I made uh, I made clear right at the outset in relation to the fact that I haven't seen Mr. Christensen's particular comments. But the government makes no apologies for encouraging everybody to speak the truth when it comes to vaccinations, to apply the evidence as presented by the chief medical officer, as presented by the head of the Therapeutic Goods Administration. Order, as backed by our government through Time our health advisers. Expired. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, just uh, whilst question time was proceeding, Senator Canavan tweeted in defence of, of Mr Kelly, no, saying, and I quote, I think we need more Craig Kellys willing to say unpopular things, because it is only by challenging ideas that we get better ideas. Does Prime Minister Morrison agree with Senator Canavan's comments in relation to Mr Kelly? And if he does not, will he make clear that Senator Canavan's comments do not represent the position of the Morrison government? Order. I'll call Senator Birmingham when I'll be able to hear him. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, it's always important to have people who will test and challenge views and opinions. Order. Who will test and challenge views Order. and opinions. However, Order. however, Mr. President, it is equally important in relation to dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic that government and those speaking to the public advocate for the facts of the matter and follow the factual advice that is presented. And our government has been consistent from this time last year and indeed slightly before it in acting and following on the health advice provided to us. Order. We have acted Senator on the health advice at each step of the way. That health advice has served the nation well, and we have acted on the health advice the in relation to the vaccination strategy that's been developed, and we will continue to follow that health advice in delivering upon Order. that vaccination Senator strategy. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Can the minister representing the Prime Minister please explain why the Prime Minister refuses to publicly repudiate his own MPs. Is it because he doesn't want to upset the backbench, or does he believe there is political benefit for him in their spreading of misinformation? Order. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, I've stated time and time and time again during this question time now the fact that the Prime Minister has made clear that he and the government do not support any views, any views that undermine the vaccination strategy, no matter who they are made, no matter who makes them. And Mr. President, my advice Order. to Keneally. everyone in this place and to everyone across this parliament and indeed to Order. all Australians, whether you are a member of the public or a member Senator of parliament or a member of the media, 
is to listen to the advice Senator of the health experts. We employ a Chief Medical Officer of Australia for good reason. Senator Watt, we employ Senator a head of the Therapeutic Goods Administration for good reason. We have acted on their advice. Order. In Senator doing Birmingham, so, can you, we have procured Senator Birmingham, can you please million resume million your doses. seat. Senator Birmingham, Senator Birmingham, please resume your seat. Senators, question time is a time of interaction, despite all interjections being disorderly. I accept that. But when I call a senator by name, it is usually because they have been constantly interjecting, and I do expect them to not continue unabated. Senator Birmingham, please continue. Mr President, we've procured 140 million doses of a variety of vaccines to be spread across this country and distributed according to a detailed strategy. That's the government's priority. That's what we will Order. deliver Senator to keep Birmingham, Australia safe and secure. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. <laughs> Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Watt. Uh, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Colbeck and Birmingham to the questions asked by Senators Wong, Keneally, Gallagher and myself. Uh, well, doesn't this Craig Kelly problem just become worse and worse for the government? Mr Kelly, over the last few months has engaged in a deliberate campaign of misinformation to the Australian public about the most serious health challenge our country has faced in decades. For months now, Mr Kelly has used his own social media channels to communicate misinformation and falsehoods about vaccines and about what he refers to as treatments which have no basis in reality whatsoever. Mr Kelly, backed up by Mr Christensen and a number of other government members, have completely undermined the government's vaccine strategy by encouraging the Australian public to ignore real health advice from real experts and instead rely on conspiracy theorists and nut jobs circulating in, the cyber in cyberspace. And I hear Senator Abetz laughing along as we debate this very important issue, and in doing so, Senator Abetz betrays his support for the actions of Mr Hughes and all of the other right-wing nutjobs in this government who, complete, who continue to propagate conspiracy theories and undermine public confidence in the health response of their own government. Now, we've seen for months, as Mr Kelly and others have done this, the Prime Minister has let them off the leash, happy to let them get out there and communicate their falsehoods and their misinformation to the Australian public, uh, because Mr Morrison knows that he draws the political gain from allowing them off the leash. You won't hear Mr Morrison or Mr. Bur Senator Birmingham or any other leader of this government say the same things as Mr Kelly. Uh, and Mr Christensen, but they're very happy for it to go on because they know that there is a constituency for these kind of views out there, and they're happy for Mr Christensen, Mr Hughes and others to get those votes to help this government stay in power. What a dishonest uh, and lacking in integrity approach of this Prime Minister and this government to adopt, to allow members of their own government to get out and, sp and spread sp conspiracy theories and, frankly, dangerous messages to the Australian population at the very time that we need the Australian population accepting proper health advice and taking proper precautions here. So the Prime Minister and his colleagues are playing a double game here. On the one hand, they, the leaders of this government, get out there and surround themselves with public health experts and encourage people to do the right thing and listen to real experts, while at the same time they're playing footsie with the far right of the Australian community and the conspiracy theorists who follow Pete Evans and other people uh, in order to show that they are actually supporting them as well. They, you'll never get Mr Morrison, the Prime Minister, supporting what Craig Kelly is doing, but he's been more than happy to let it go on for months. And it was only after weeks of pressure from the opposition that he was finally dragged kicking and screaming into some meeting with Mr Kelly yesterday. 
Now, Mr Kelly, of course, issued a backdown of sorts uh, only a couple of hours ago and said that from now on he'd be a good boy, he'd listen to what the Prime Minister was saying, he'd get behind the government's approach. And I was sitting there thinking, how long is it going to take before Craig Kelly's back out there on Facebook reverting to type and spreading more conspiracy theories? But Senator Canavan has actually beaten Mr Kelly to the punch because Senator Canavan couldn't even wait until question time was over before he had his own tweet out there circulating amongst the right-wing nutjob cyberspace, uh, supporting these conspiracy theories and backing in Craig Kelly. This has now become a test of the Prime Minister's authority over his government. He finally was able to exert some level of control over Craig Kelly in spreading misinformation, but now it's the Nationals. The now the Nationals are often racing because the Prime Minister can't control the Nationals in the same way that he can control his own backbench. So what we're going to see now in coming days is Mr Christensen, Senator Canavan and other members of the National Party engaging in exactly the same conspiracy theories and misinformation that we've seen from Mr Kelly over recent weeks. And now the question for Mr Morrison is, will he exert the same control over the National Party and rein them in from spreading mis uh, misinformation as he has attempted to do with his own party? Thank you, Senator Watts. Senator Repetz. Madam Deputy President, the Labor senator that has just spoken has introduced the issue of prime ministerial leadership. Well, on this side, we have a leader behind whom we are all united, unlike the Australian Labor Party, who has the hapless leader known as Mr Albanese, but down whose neck Ms Plibersek, Mr Chalmers, Mr Miles, Mr Shorten are all breathing. The simple fact is the Australian people know where the government stands on this important issue of seeking to get a vaccine out as quickly as possible, as effectively as possible, for the protection of the Australian community. A very coherent, well thought out policy, and that is what actually interests the people of Australia. Now, every political party, thank goodness, has people who will speak out on issues and provide an alternate point of view. Mr Kelly is doing that in relation to this issue. Do I necessarily agree with him? No. But you know what, Madam Deputy President? The Australian Labor Party has won Mr Joel Fitzgibbon, who's got a very strong alternate point of view in relation to certain Labor Party policies, and as a result of his agitation, one Mr Butler met his demise from a certain position in the shadow cabinet. I turn to the Australian Greens and I recall the internal bra brawls they suffered when they uh, rejoiced with uh, people such as Senator Nettle and Senator Rhiannon in their midst. That is part and parcel of the dynamics of democracy, that you will have men and women in political parties offering an alternate point of view. We in the Liberal Party are more than willing to accommodate and accept that there are people with alternate points of view who should be given in the public space the opportunity to give expression to those views, even if you vehemently disagree with them. Whereas within the Labor Party, what we are seeing more and more is their view that you have to adopt a groupthink. Nobody is allowed to have an alternate point of view or consider a different approach. We on this side are more representative of the Australian people, and I suggest that is why we sit on this side, because we are willing to accommodate and accept that different people have differing views. Now, if the Australian Labor Party were genuinely serious about their concern about the COVID response, where was the good senator and the Australian Labor Party when the ABC had Dr Norman Swan night after night contradicting the chief medical officer at the height of the pandemic. Not a whisper out of them. Dr Swan making these outrageous predictions of thousands of deaths. These predictions never came to pass. But, oh, Dr Swan happens to be potentially of the left and with the ABC. So his criticism of these matters and of the government approach 
is to be accepted, not to be criticised. Mr Kelly, we might be able to describe as somewhat from the conservative side, and therefore he must be condemned. It is the double standard that the left always bring to these debates that exposes their shallowness and hollowness. If the Labor Party, Madam Deputy President, were consistent and would have condemned Dr Norman Swan as much as they are seeking to condemn Mr Kelly, I would say there is some integrity and consistency in their approach to this. No, this is pure political point scoring or an attempt to do so. But in doing so, I dare say all they're doing is elevating uh, Mr Kelly's profile as the member for Hughes, who is working very hard and diligently in the service of the people of Hughes and giving expression to a point of view that, in a free democracy, people ought to be allowed to give expression to. But that said, the government's policy is very clear. Later this month, or very shortly, we hope to be able to be rolling out vaccines when and as they uh, become available. We as a government are working hard, and the Prime Minister's leadership has been in contrast, absolute contrast, to that of the shambles of the Australian Labor Party under the leadership of Mr Albanese. Thank you, Senator Rebetz. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I think um, you know, the senator opposite doesn't really seem to grasp the seriousness of the situation, nor the seriousness of um, members of the government going out and peddling not something that's unpopular, but it's wrong. It's dangerous. This is something that the uh, members of the government have failed to grasp, and that is why it has, was always important that they uh, reined in Mr Kelly as quickly as possible and go public out there to say what Mr Kelly is saying is wrong, you shouldn't be listening to him, and we will be speaking to him. That's what the Prime Minister should have been doing, and that would have been strong leadership. But we haven't seen it. We haven't even seen it in this chamber. You know, yesterday's answers to question time, they they just they went they rambled. They were all over the garden path. And today wasn't even much better because we are talking about something that is of an extremely serious nature, and the Australian people deserve full and comprehensive answers. Now we know how essential. Um, uh, that, uh, that the vac vaccine rollout is taken up um, within the community. We know how important that is to the success of this nation in 2021 and beyond. A successful vaccine rollout will not only keep the Australian people safe and healthy, but it's also essential to our economic recovery. A successful vaccine rollout will be critical to underpinning a national recovery built on the back of more jobs and higher wages. Indeed, a successful vaccine rollout is critical to national economic confidence. That is why it is important that the public have confidence in the nation's vaccine distribution. And the very last thing we need is for the government's own members to be undermining and attacking national health uh, efforts and advice. Now, we heard today that Mr Kelly has put out a statement, so, but we've also heard we've had a breakout from Mr Christensen on Facebook last night. And why we're in question time today, after the, the Senate leader had um, given a response around Mr Kelly's uh, um, actions, Senator Canavan. I know most people probably would say, well. If it was going to be anybody, it was going to be Senator Canavan talking about, about uh, this is just about people wanting to shut down unpopular debate. It's not unpopular debate. It's dangerous language, dangerous misinformation that Mr Kelly is putting out there. This is why it is important, and this is why the Labor Party has raised it. We've all seen. Mr Kelly and his, his exchange with uh, Ms Plibersek, 
He is all over the shop. He is all over the shop. He will continue, in my view, he will continue to peddle this misinformation and put it out in, into the public arena, which we cannot afford to do. We need a vaccine rollout to be success, successful and taken up broadly within the community. Australia's prosperity and health depends on it. But the, you know, the mind boggles over the member for Hughes hawking pseudoscience and peddling snake oil cures. cures. It, it, you know, the members of the government's own team directly and deliberately undermining the government's own message and official public health help advice. And the government does nothing to discipline. It, they haven't disciplined Mr Kelly. They haven't disciplined him. They've done nothing really to bring him to heel. Why? And why indeed? So this is a question that people ha are asking. Members of parliament are asking why. Members of the community are asking why. Why don't they bring him to heel? Now, you know, we know that the Prime Minister went, actually went out of his way to directly intervene to protect the member for Hughes before the last election. But something has to be done about Thank you, the members Brown. of the government that continue to peddle mis— Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The irresponsibility that we are currently seeing from the Labor Party is just their latest example of the politicisation of the COVID-19 pandemic. We saw when they couldn't get any traction, when they were being supportive of what they should have been, the fantastic efforts made by the Morrison government to keep Australia as one of the safest countries in the world with the most minimal economic of impacts felt. We have weathered this storm better than most other countries. But when that bipartisan support wasn't quite working out anymore, we've seen an overt politicisation in every single way they could possibly come up with. And this is just another example of that. And so rather than working to support everyday Australians and demonstrate some restraint, they're continuing to draw focus away from health advice that this government looks to. The Morrison government is focused on a safe and effective vaccine rollout. And just to confirm, it'll be a free and voluntary vaccine rollout. But I do welcome today that the Prime Minister has spoken to Mr Kelly, and I look forward to everyone in this place getting behind the vaccine rollout in a positive way, that Australians will have confidence in the vaccine solution. But I have a particular interest in this debate. As most of you know, I have an absolutely gorgeous son who has autism. His autism was caused in utero, genetically, not because of any actions of the parents, and certainly not because of vaccines. So much time, effort and money has been wasted on autism because of a fraudulent belief in the work of a discredited doctor, Dr Andrew Wakefield. He is a fraud who has been struck off, who has absolutely destroyed many parents' confidence in a vaccine for their children under this belief that somehow autism is a fate worse than death, even if it was true, which we know it is not. So the tinfoil hat brigade who love to grasp to vaccines causing autism, and I can assure you it doesn't, none of them do, that they are continuing to cling to some form of conspiracy theory. We remember it was 5G that caused COVID, there was probably a few other things I've forgotten. It's been quite the year, but the 5G particularly stands out. That Bill Gates was looking just to microchip us all. I can tell you when you've got a kid with autism that runs away, the microchip is not a bad idea at times, but I digress. But the conspiracy theorists that you know, were continually trying to undermine COVID efforts, that the, it was, the virus wasn't real, it was some form of conspiracy. These are fundamentally buying into the anti-vaccine message. And we need to work not as government purely and solely, but as a parliament, as leaders of this country, to ensure that all Australians have confidence in the vaccine, 
so that they will go out, even though it is free and voluntary, and receive the vaccine as soon as they are eligible. And the health minister, along with the prime minister, has worked incredibly hard to ensure that Australians will be protected by enough vaccines, that the TGA approval has been done to give Australians confidence in the safety and the security of the vaccines, that the rollout of them occurs in a way that adheres to the best possible health and medical advice. So fear-mongering about vaccines, whoever it's by, is wrong, but giving it additional airtime is worse. These ideas, these notions that we all know are incorrect should be ignored. By highlighting them to Australians, it is undermining confidence, which is the last thing we should be doing. The rollout is the only way we will get our lives back to normal, that we'll start to see travel and the country open up, international borders open up, that we can start to reduce the overreactions and knee-jerk reactions of premiers desperate to lock their state downs just before their each election that they face. We need to ensure that Australians have confidence, feel safe and secure to receive the vaccine, to be part of the program and allow all Australians to return to the life they had pre-2020. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Polly. Thank you. The Prime Minister of this country, Scott Morrison, could have shut Craig Kelly down weeks and months ago, but he chose not to because he's a weak leader. He's a weak Prime Minister who knew what Mr Kelly was advocating through social media for month after month, sharing misinformation undermining the health experts of this country at a time when Australia was facing the worst health <laughs> challenge and pandemic in 100 years. A prime minister at this time needs to step up and show leadership. That's what the Australian community expect. That's what the Australian communities need. But what do we see? No action whatsoever in this place this week, we've had the leader in the Senate of the government dancing around the issue instead of standing up and calling out Craig Kelly for what he is, and that is a loose cannon who plays up to these theories in relation to vaccines, and all it does is feed into the right-wing nuts of this country. No leadership by the leader in this Senate chamber. Now, social media, as we all know, is a powerful tool. So the misinformation that Craig Kelly has been disseminating is out there and will continue to be out there. And if that isn't bad enough, in this question time today, what did we see but from Senator Matt Caravan? What he's doing is encouraging people who want to share the ideas of Craig Kelly to continue to do it, because if you have those sort of debates, you're going to end up with better outcomes. Well, that is nonsense. That is clearly nonsense. How many of the backbench in this government are part of that chorus line? How many? I believe there'll be more. And if anyone in this chamber thinks for one minute that the little conversation that the Prime Minister had today after the altercation with Tanya Plebisek today in this House thinks that that's going to stop Craig Kelly, you are sadly mistaken, because I have no confidence whatsoever that this will do anything to give Mr Kelly the message that his nonsense is not needed and it is harmful to the Australian community. So, quite frankly, the Prime Minister was more concerned about keeping Craig Kelly happy than the health of the Australian people. And let's get on to the Prime Minister, who, as we all know, he's always there for the photo opportunity at any time, but he never follows through. Well, he's failed again when it comes to the rollout of vaccines to COVID-19. He promised there'd be a rollout in March. 
But already he's dancing and spinning his way out of that and saying, well, no, it's going to be April now. But we're at the front of the queue. Well, let's just put on the public record some facts in relation to where Australia really is when it comes to delivering the vaccines. Now, in other countries, once it's been approved for use, it's been within days that people have been jabbed with the vaccine and already getting their second dose. But we have the US, the EU, Canada and the UK all administered their first doses within a week of approval. Now in the UK, more than 9.2 million people have been vaccinated. How many in, Tas in Australia have been vaccinated? None. The TGA approved Pfizer's vaccine well over a week ago, and there is still no time frame. No time frame for when the vaccines will arrive in Australia or when they are going to be rolled out. The clock is ticking on you, Mr Morrison. The Australian people deserve so much more. Now, we know that they have used COVID-19 as the excuse for their failings economically. They're using it as an excuse for the attack on Australian workers. This government cannot even be trusted to deliver a vaccine in a timely manner to all Australians. And it's all right uh, for Mr Senator Dunham there to smile at my comments, but Tasmanians deserve so much better. We have the oldest population in this country, and to have uh, thank that. You, Senator Polly, please resume your seat. Senator Dunham. The point of order. I wasn't smiling at anything. Senator, Senator Dunham, Polly that's was saying not a there's point nothing to smile order. about. Please what a ridiculous thing seat. to say. Thank you, Senator Polly. Your time has expired. Senator Polly. Senator Polly, I've asked you to resume your seat. Senator Polly. I was going to remind you as well, when you refer to others in the other place, please use their correct title. And I generally remind all senators because I'm having to pull people up more and more. It is respectful. Thank you, Senator Polly. It's not a debating point. I'm just outlining to you what the requirements are. Thank you. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Watt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given uh, to my question by uh, the Leader of the Government, uh, Senator Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister. And of course, I asked the Government today uh, when indeed they will respond uh, in full to the recommendations in the alarming report and review of Australia's environment laws conducted by Professor Graham Samuel. Of course, this was a review that was done under law. It was required because every 10 years we review the adequacy of our environment laws. And this report shows that the adequacy of our environment laws are woeful. They are not protecting our forests. They're not protecting our animals. They're not protecting our precious places, our beaches and coastlines. In fact, they're not protecting them. And instead, they're allowing our precious parts of this country, precious parts of our wilderness, our bushland, many of our native animals, to be trashed and endangered uh, by development, by mining, by forestry, by big developers. It's time that we had laws in this country that actually protect our environment and don't uh, offer an incentive for those who do the wrong thing to keep getting away with it. One of the key recommendations in this report, in recommendation number 15, is that the regional forest agreements that are currently in place that allow logging in Australia's native forests should not be exempt from our environment laws. That is a fundamental point being made here in this report that has been handed to the government and is waiting for a response. And just today, the federal court has handed down a decision in relation to logging in native forests and the validity of these regional forest agreements. 
and have said, well, under the law as it is, this logging is able to continue. Now, many, many Australians will be shocked to hear that it is perfectly legal in this country to log in our native forests, to endanger our native animals in these native forests, that there is no environmental law in this country that protects these forests and these animals from these logging companies and from these logging projects. Isn't that unthinkable? That despite how precious our environment is, despite what little native forests we have left in this country, that it is perfectly legal under current law to trash and burn. It is quite clear in the review and the Order, report put Senator forward. Hanson Young, time for contributions expired. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it.